We're going to go live. And we're, oh, here we go. Okay, so I am Terry Camerzell, and I'm here on behalf of Creation Fellowship Santee. We're a group of friends bound by our common agreement that the creation account, as told in Genesis, is a true depiction of how God created every all life um, just a few thousand years ago and in a six-day, 24-hour day span. Uh, we've been meeting online here on Zoom since June of 2020, and we've been blessed with a great amount of great number of speakers who have come and presented on creation topics and topics, um, other theology type topics, and also current events type topics. And um, you can find links to most of those past presentations by going to tinyurl.com forward slash CF Santee, that's C like creation, F like fellowship, Santee is spelled S-A-N-T-E-E. -E. You can also email us at creationfellowshipsantee at gmail.com. We don't spam, but, but if you email us, you'll get on our email list so that you don't miss any of our upcoming speakers. As I mentioned, sometimes our topics are current events topics rather than creation science. A lot of times we like to refer to those topics as the consequences of evolutionary thinking. And tonight we have a return speaker who has something just along those lines. Alex Newman is a journalist. He's the CEO of the Liberty Sentinel, and he's also the executive director of Public School Exit. He's also a contributor to the Epic Times and the New American, and he has quite a bit of international journalism experience, including when he went to the COP27 in Egypt in November of 2022. So he's going to speak to us tonight about his time there, and I'll let him explain what COP27 is as well. Alex, it's good to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you. And so, uh, as Terry mentioned, I, I was just in uh, Egypt a few months ago for the UN COP27. I try to go to these. I've been to most of them since I graduated from college uh, back in like 2009 was the first one I went to in, um, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, and I've been trying to go to them. And what I've noticed is an increasing an increasingly obvious religious fervor to these. And so I'm going to share a little bit with you guys about what I saw in Egypt uh, on the religious front. Uh, actually, it was so the, the religious thing was so significant that I ended up making that the primary focus of um, my article that I wrote. I'm trying to find a copy of the magazine here so I can show you guys. But, um, you know, usually when I go there, I write about, you know, the the agreement and those things. And I and I did that this time. But um, my most important story was about the religious aspect of this. Let me see if I can um, well, I'll, I'll pull up a copy for you guys in a moment, but um, I'll start with uh, sharing this presentation. I, I didn't quite get a chance to finish it all. I thought I had um, a little bit more time than I actually did, but let me uh, throw it up on the screen here. And uh, all right, so let's do a slideshow. So, um, you know, I mentioned that I had seen uh, more and more uh, stuff on the religious front, but I want to start off with uh, the Club of Rome. Can you guys see this that I'm showing you? Oh, no, maybe not. Okay, let's no, see. So. not yet. All righty, let's see now if that works. Yes, now we can see it. Now you guys see it. Okay, cool. Um, so. Um, before we get into the, the religious overtones of this, um, you know, this has been a long term agenda. There's a, a group called the Club of Rome, uh, primarily globalists and communists uh, come together. Very powerful people, Al Gore, John Kerry, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, these types of people. And uh, back in 1991, as the Cold War was coming to an end, uh, these people determined that they needed some new pretext to justify massive government, huge government intervention in the lives of people, huge bureaucracy, uh, huge um, you know, taxation. And so they came up with this idea and they, they put it on paper in this report. Uh, it was called the First Global Revolution. And they said, in searching for a common enemy against whom we can unite, we came up with this idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. Um, all these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it's only through changed attitudes and behaviors 
that they can be overcome. So uh, back, you know, what is that, 30 something years ago, they were talking about this need for changed attitudes and behaviors. Uh, and they concluded with the real enemy then is humanity itself, um, which is absolutely correct. Now, obviously, one of the symptoms of this is uh, much higher energy prices. And we'll, we'll get into the theological side. But Obama even admitted this uh, in uh, this statement while he was running for president. You know, under my plan uh, of a cap and trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. So we need to have electricity rates that will necessarily skyrocket. Um, I, I, if we have more time, I will delve into this a little bit deeper. Um, you know, the, the idea that man is causing uh, climate change, that our CO2 emissions is producing catastrophic global warming um, is ridiculous. It, it is pseudoscience. It is not backed up by the evidence, by the data. Um, and uh, their own numbers actually show this. So uh, if we have time, like I said, we'll get into more detail at the end. But all you really need to know to know that we are being deceived is the information that you see on this graph here. Uh, in 1975, um, you know, you see where the temperature was. And so this red line that you see on that graph right there, uh, this is the average of all the 73 UN computer models. They, they put uh, these models together where they add different factors, clouds and rain and, and sun and CO2, et cetera. Uh, and that supposedly is going to spit out uh, what the future looks like. So they had 73 models that the UN came up with. And the average is that red line there. But what you see with the green and the blue lines, that is the actual temperatures that were observed through uh, the blue line was uh, the weather balloon data. The, or excuse me, the green line was the weather balloon data. The blue line was the satellite data. And so what you see is that even though uh, CO2 emissions increased quite radically, actually, from 1975 through about uh, 2012 or 2013, where this graph ends, um, what you see is that there's been almost no change in temperature. Uh, and in fact, over the last eight years, not only has there been no increase in temperature, there's been a slight decrease in temperature, even though human emissions of CO2 have continued to increase. And so what this means uh, very, uh, in very abbreviated form is that the idea that CO2 in the atmosphere causes man-made global warming, uh, causes climate change, is simply wrong. Uh, the hypothesis is incorrect. Um, and, and I would suggest to you that this, uh, this red graph here actually provides evidence of deliberate deception. Um, you know, if, if this was just uh, well-meaning but um, but unintentional error, you'd expect that something like half of the uh, uh, models would have been higher, half of the models would have been lower than what actually happened, uh, or at least something within you know a, a narrow range. Uh, instead, what we see is that all of the models massively overestimated uh, warming. And um, I, I, I kind of joke that you could put a monkey in a cage with some dice and, and he could roll the dice and the monkey would do a much better job than all the UN's so-called scientists and supercomputer models and all this kind of stuff. Um, they do want to use this climate change pretext to kind of do what they did to us during COVID. And again, if we have more time at the end, we'll, we'll maybe um, spend a little bit more time on that. But I want to show you guys just what I've seen on the religious front. Um, so uh, in 2010, uh, I, like I mentioned, I went to the first climate conference in 2009. In 2010, um, they always have the, um, the climate meetings in these exotic destinations. In 2010, they decided to meet in Cancun. Uh, and the UN climate czarina, Cristina Figueres, um, she opened up the meeting. So she, she was the uh, executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. And um, she opened up the meeting and she said, we're going to start off with a prayer to the Mayan goddess Ixchel. Uh, she said that Ixchel was the goddess of tapestries and creativity. And so that it would be appropriate for us to, to start off with a prayer to this Mayan goddess Ixchel, because she would help us to be creative while we weave a tapestry, she said, of climate solutions. And if I had more time, I would have gotten the video for you. But uh, I'm sitting there watching this. Like, What in the world? We're, we're praying to defunct demonic pagan deities to bless our climate summit. That's kind of weird. Uh, so I pull out my laptop and, uh, you know, start looking this up. The very first thing that popped up when I looked up Ixchel was that she was the goddess of cannibalism and human sacrifice and war. Uh, so that was interesting. Why would you want to start a, um, a climate summit with a prayer to a pagan deity of cannibalism and human sacrifice and war? Um, once you really understand the climate agenda, um, you understand that that is quite appropriate. In fact, I almost can't think of a more perfect demon to have started this uh, conference with a prayer to. So uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, now, 
Uh, fast forward to the most recent conference. We're going to switch back and forth, but this is what happened at the most recent conference. Uh, this is the Secretary General of the United Nations giving you some insight into, um, and, and you know, for some context here, um, I have watched the tone of this uh, climate extremism go up and up and up. Uh, you know, when I first started going to these, they were still talking about global warming. Uh, they were starting to, you know, this was in 2009, they were starting to shift over to climate change. Uh, and then over the next few years, it gradually became um, climate crisis. Um, and then uh, I went to the uh, UN summit in, um, in Madrid. It was supposed to be in Chile in 2019. Uh, and then they started talking about a climate emergency. Uh, well, in 2022, in Egypt, they were talking about climate hell. We are going to climate hell unless we figure out how to deal with this. So here's the Secretary General warning us that we are going to climate hell unless we deal with our climate sins. Watch. And the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising. And our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. So we are on the highway to climate hell. Isn't that interesting? The highway to climate hell. Um, they never quite explain what climate hell uh, is going to be like, but apparently very bad. Um, you know, a lot, they want you to picture like raging seas and storms and floods and, and yeah, I really whatever weather event. Too much snow, climate hell. Not enough snow, climate hell. Too much rain, not enough rain, climate hell. Uh, fires, no fires, climate hell. Um, tsunamis, rising sea levels, and all the rest of it. Uh, and over the years, I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of even the UN zone scientists. If we have time, I'll get into some of them. But they have made very clear that um, this is a fraudulent agenda, um, and uh, you should not be terrified by this. Now, it wasn't just the Secretary General of the UN uh, and some background on him. Uh, before becoming the Secretary General of the United Nations, I call it the United Abominations, um, he was actually the uh, head of what's called the Socialist International. Uh, this is the world's largest alliance of socialist and communist political parties. Um, they, uh, some of their members have the blood of millions of people on their hands, and they actually govern most of the nations of the world when you take all of their members as a whole. Uh, but it wasn't just uh, former Secretary General uh, and of, of the uh, Socialist International and Secretary General of the UN saying we were going to climate hell. Here's Joe Biden. We're racing forward to do our part to avert the climate hell that the UN Secretary General so passionately warned about earlier this week. All right, so hopefully Biden will be able to do enough works to save us from the climate hell. Um, and, uh, you know, that's very much what they are working on. Now, um, there have been many other uh, very bizarre religious admissions, and we will get to the new Ten Commandments in a moment. But um, in 2012, I went down to Rio de Janeiro for the uh, UN Conference on Sustainable Development. A big part of this was, was climate, but uh, it was bigger than that, right? Sustainable development kind of takes into account climate and all these other things. Um, and at this summit, they actually, uh, you guys probably recognize the, the uh, statue of Jesus Christ on top of Mount Corcovado. They call it Christ the Redeemer. Uh, it kind of overlooks the city. And for this UN conference, they lit it up in green. Um, they, this whole statue was this violent green. Um, and one of the guys I was spending time with down there, we spent the whole day together, was Lord Christopher Moncton, um, brilliant uh, scientist. He's written numerous peer-reviewed papers on climate change. Um, and he was also the science advisor to uh, former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, uh, the, the, one of the most conservative prime ministers of the last 50 years in the UK. Uh, and what he told me about this green um, Jesus statue was that uh, this was, and I'm quoting here, a, a kind of childish message that the environmental religion is now replacing Christianity. Um, and, and many of them have been clear that this is actually their, um, their religious view. Um, this guy right here, uh, Rajenda Pachuri, he was the head of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and in 2015, he famously uh, wrote a letter where he talked about his real motivations. He says, for me, the protection of planet Earth, the survival of all species, and the sustainability of our ecosystems is more than a mission. It is my religion and my dharma. Now, this is a guy who comes from you know Eastern mystic traditions, uh, Hinduism, uh, paganism. 
but uh, very, very clearly uh, on what he was talking about there. Now, they, they haven't been promoting global warming from the start, right? Before um, man-made global warming, you actually had uh, man-made global cooling. Uh, this actually came out of Time Magazine right here. And as you read it, you'll see that human emissions of CO2 are causing global cooling. Uh, it's going to cause a new ice age. Uh, it is going to result in massive starvation. Uh, but there is a solution. The solution is to give the UN more money and more power, um, which is interesting. And also, you have to get rid of fossil fuels. You have to reduce energy consumption. You have to have global taxes. Uh, the, the only difference between the solutions they were proposing to global cooling and the solutions they are proposing now to alleged man-made global warming is that they also wanted to melt the North Polar ice cap. Uh, they actually proposed, and you can read this in this article, they proposed covering the uh, polar ice cap with black soot uh, to melt it so that it wouldn't kind of encompass the whole globe uh, like the last ice age. So uh, that's just some background there. Now, right before they started the UN Climate Summit in Egypt, uh, the UN Development Project, one of their most important agencies, put out this very interesting report. Uh, and what they said was that, um, and these are direct quotes from the report, but it, evolutionary processes and ethical reasoning may have interacted to, to reach um, uh, in reaching the current prevailing configurations of behaviors and institutions. Uh, but today's uncertain times have novel elements that present fundamentally new challenges. And those configurations, and it unfortunately got cut off here, sorry, uh, may not be a good match for taking care of the planet. Uh, so what they're arguing here in pretty plain language is that the ethical and moral systems that we that exist today, uh, which, you know, primarily even even for non-believers are still largely based on uh, the, you know, the, the laws that God gave to Moses, the Ten Commandments, don't don't murder, don't steal, uh, don't lie, don't commit adultery. Right. I mean, we kind of people around the world today kind of take these for granted. Of course, God wrote his laws on our heart. Uh, but what the U.N. is saying is that these um ethical and, and moral ideas evolved over thousands of years, uh, and that they are no longer suitable for the new world that we live in, a world in which the planet is supposedly being destroyed. Uh, and so they're arguing, as they say on the next slide, uh, and, and again, you can read this report for yourself, it's about 160 pages. Uh, they say that we can use this uncertainty to act differently, empower individuals and societies to adopt fundamental changes and choices that lead people to act according to new moral codes. Um, and this is, again, word for word out of this UN report that they released right before the UN Climate Summit. So new moral codes are needed because the old moral codes that supposedly evolved with mankind over thousands of years are producing climate change and uh, environmental degradation, supposedly. Uh, so we need new moral codes. Well, the first thing I saw when I landed in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, the, uh, the town on the Sinai Peninsula where this uh, conference took place, was this atrocity right here. This is actually a picture that uh, my colleague took. Her name is Annika. Uh, and this was at the airport waiting for us when we got out. Um, and uh, you see right there the pagan symbology. They've got, you know, the, the Egyptian sun god symbol is actually part of the official COP27 logo. Uh, and on this official UN sign, uh, they quote from this thing called the Declaration of Innocence before being judged before the scale of Mat and entering the afterlife. Uh, this is a pagan Egyptian document, supposedly written more than 4,000 years ago, that outlines what you need to do before you go into this uh, pagan afterlife. Uh, and one of the things, and you can actually see this on here, one of the sins that is listed is, I have not polluted the water or the earth. So uh, you have been a good person, right? works-based salvation, and you were a good person partly because you didn't pollute the water or the earth. Uh, and so the UN thought this would be very appropriate to put up on these very expensive posters that taxpayers paid for. Um, and, and they did. You see it right here, right? They put this big uh, pagan moral code onto these signs, uh, officially welcoming um, thousands of representatives of governments, uh, presidents, prime ministers, kings, dictators, CEOs, um, climate diplomats, ambassadors, uh, you know, you name it, foreign ministers, economy ministers, etc., all showing up here uh, and being greeted by a pagan Egyptian document about how you get into the afterlife. And of course, thing one is uh, you didn't sin by polluting the earth and the water. That's very interesting. All right, so a couple of days into this UN climate clown show, um, they had religious leaders from all over the world participate. The, uh, the Catholic Church sent a, a big delegation. Uh, the Orthodox uh, churches, even some evangelical 
churches uh, sent major delegations to this thing. Uh, actually, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, you know, one of the biggest Protestant denominations, leaders of the Protestant denominations, uh, offered his support and sent a, a delegation. So they had hundreds of these religious leaders from all over the world participate in this thing. Uh, now, the Egyptian government would not let them all walk up to the top of what they claim is Mount Sinai for security purposes. Uh, so they only allowed uh, a representative sample, but they flew in, you know, they had Hindus, they had Buddhists, they had Shintos, they had Jews, they had Muslims, they had uh, all different varieties of supposed Christians. Uh, they had, uh, they, they flew in this guy from the Amazon rainforest. He had like this big feather headdress or whatever, some kind of spirit worshiper. Uh, and they said he was the uh, the representative of indigenous pagan spirituality from the Amazon. All Every kind of religion you could imagine, right? every kind of false religion you could imagine was represented there. Um, and the delegation that had come to the Sinai that was allowed to walk up to the peninsula walked up, uh, walked up to the uh, top of Mount Sinai, or what they say was Mount Sinai. You know, there's, there's a new documentary that suggests it might be in Saudi Arabia. I, you know, I, we won't wade into that debate today. I don't know. This is what is considered to be Mount Sinai. Um, so the Egyptian government allowed uh, you know, a few dozen of them to walk up. The ones who weren't allowed, they met in Jerusalem. They met in London. They, they stayed at the UN conference. They met in uh, South America. They met in New York. Uh, they had all these big, uh, what they called climate repentance ceremonies. Um, and, you know, as I was um, hearing, they wouldn't let me, like I said, walk up to the top of Mount Sinai. I had to go the next day because for security reasons, the Egyptian government wouldn't let everybody go. But um, as, as I'm reading about it, I'm watching videos of these climate repentance ceremonies. All I could think of was, um, you know, Ahab's priests, you know, the, these priests of Baal, um, as Elijah is mocking them. And they're like, you know, dancing around and trying to summon Baal to, you know, do something. And, and Elijah's like, maybe he's going to the bathroom or, you know, whatever. Um, it's just bizarre climate repentance ceremony. So they're repenting of their climate sins. They're repenting for their CO2 emissions. They're repenting uh, for their air travel. They're repenting for eating meat. Um, very, very bizarre. Uh, and then this one guy whips out the new Ten Commandments. You actually can see a picture of it right here, the green Ten Commandments. Um, and he, he you know, gives some words about how uh, we, the religious leaders of the world, uh, uh, are, are very upset that the political leaders of the world are not doing enough to, to save Mother Earth from the ravages of climate change or whatever. Uh, and so this weirdo actually takes these Ten Commandments, his fake Ten Commandments, and smashes them um, on the ground, uh, kind of like Moses did when he saw the Israelites worshiping this calf. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that this guy knew the biblical text well enough to see the incredible irony of what he was doing, right? Uh, obviously, Moses was very upset because people were worshiping false gods. They were, they were doing silly things. Uh, that's why he broke the Ten Commandments. In this case, the people worshiping the false gods uh, coming up with silly things are the ones breaking the Ten Commandments. Um, I, I don't know if they were deliberately trying to, to mock God, to, to be funny, uh, or if they just were, were just so ignorant of the biblical text, but it was quite ironic anyway. Um, and through divine providence, uh, God actually brought me into contact with the leaders, uh, the organizers of this whole thing. Uh, so it, at the UN conference, this was uh, the next day, um, I ran into four of the key organizers. You had a Rabbi Jonathan Nerl. Uh, he, he's the head of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, uh, backed by the UN. Uh, we had um, James Sternlich, the CEO of the Peace Department, who you're going to meet in just a moment. Uh, there was Metropolitan Seraphim of the Orthodox uh, Christian Church, Greek Orthodox Church, uh, and then uh, another young individual um, purporting to represent the World Evangelical Alliance. So these are some of the key ringleaders. Uh, and I, I had an opportunity to talk to them for 45 minutes. Uh, thankfully, they did not recognize me. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I saw them, I knew who they were. I said, Hey, you know, can I interview you guys about, you know, what was going on with your, your, your you know, your new 10 commandments and your climate repentance ceremony. And uh, you can go watch that. It's 45 minutes. Uh, again, you know, I'm a journalist there. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not wearing my, um, Alex Newman, the evangelist and uh, passionate uh, Bible believing Christian. I'm there as a journalist. I'm, I'm there gathering facts, gathering information. So I'm just asking these guys questions, you know, I'm not telling them what I think. Uh, and for whatever reason, they didn't realize that, um, I was not very sympathetic to the blasphemous things they were saying. But um, I did ask, you know, American evangelicals, a lot of them were pretty upset about your, you know, your whole new Ten Commandments thing. Like, you know, some people were even saying that was blasphemous. And uh, they're all like, oh, yeah, they got kind of sheepish. They're like, yeah, you know, we we, we realize in retrospect, uh, you know, that might have been some bad marketing. Got a lot of pushback on that. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of calling this now an addendum to the Ten Commandments. It's not like a, it's not replacing the Ten Commandments and just a, a, an addition to the Ten Commandments, if you will. Um, and so I want you guys to listen to this guy, the CEO of the Peace Department, James Sternlich, talking to me 
about the, the new Ten Commandments and uh, also what he calls the Third Covenant and how they're going to build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Watch. All religions teach us to respect the creation that we have been given. And we've done kind of a terrible job of that. And so with a t new kind of Ten Commandments of climate change, which are an addendum to, not a replacement for, the original Ten Commandments, and a third covenant that we're some kind of working on between mankind and creation, that we would refocus on those elements of the teachings from across religions that point us in the direction of fixing the problems that we've created so that life can thrive on this planet and so that we can build that proverbial kingdom of heaven here on earth. So there you heard it. All right. So uh, yeah, that's me at the top of Mount Sinai. But uh, pretty interesting right there, right? He, he says we are going to um, use this new third covenant that we're creating. So God gave us the old covenant. God gave us the new covenant. Uh, the UN and their interfaith um, stooges are going to give us the third covenant. Uh, and we're going to use this third covenant to build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Um, and, you know, to, to a Bible believing Christian, that sounds like nails on a chalkboard, of course. It sounds preposterous. Um, and yet these people saw no problem with that. They're all, they're all nodding their heads and stuff. I mean, truly unbelievable, the level of blasphemy here. Uh, this is actually a press release they put out uh, in Sinai, a prophetic call for climate justice and a ceremony of repentance. Uh, they're announcing their new Ten Commandments. So they did put out the new Ten Commandments. We'll go through them uh, kind of rapidly here. Um, again, they, they reframed them as an addendum after they got uh, you know a lot of pushback for coming up with the new Ten Commandments. Uh, so the, the Ten Commandments, we are stewards of this world, right? And of course, that's, uh, uh, you know, God did make us stewards of the world. Uh, but it says that uh, creation is not our possession. We recognize human responsibility to love nature. Uh, that's interesting. Um, we should love and serve the creation rather than the creator. Uh, that reminds me of something out of Romans chapter one. Uh, and then uh, creation is not simply external to God. It is permeated by God's presence. Uh, sounds uh, very pantheistic to me, right? God's not external to the creation. God's not holy. God's not a part. Uh, God is kind of in everything, right? God is in your laptop. God is in you. God is in, uh, you know, this rock. God is in this tree. God is really everything. Uh, so we're all part of the greater whole. We must care for the planet. Uh, you know, some of this stuff is just, uh, you know, nice sounding gobbledygook. Um, they say that the distinctive task for humanity is to serve this interdependent, life-giving planet. Uh, we recognize that we are responsible for the well-being of all life today. Forget God. He's not responsible. We are responsible for all life on Earth. Um, we need a disciplined spiritual life to overcome the challenges of climate change. Uh, we've got to rise above our ego. Uh, we've got to use our thought, speech, and action only for good. We've got to change our inner climate. Uh, we got to purify, raise, and transform ourselves with a higher vision, right? This is all kind of Eastern mysticism here. Uh, we got to repent of our climate sins, uh, especially your CO2 emissions. By the way, you exhale CO2, uh, about two pounds of it every day. Um, so we need to um, use mind, open heart. Uh, we have got to, uh, so compassion means suffering with others. We got to feel the pain of the earth. Okay, and those who suffer the consequences of climate change. And so those are the uh, the climate 10 commandments for you right there. Um, let me see if we're are we still sharing. Yes, we are still sharing here. Uh, so I have a lot of other stuff to uh, to share with you guys. Um, I don't have it in my slideshow. Unfortunately, like I said, I thought I was going to have um, an extra you know, hour or so to prepare this. So my apologies in advance, but uh, I do want to give you some more background on some of the religious stuff that was happening uh, before, during, and after this thing. Uh, so the UN has been very, very open about this agenda to bring religions on board with the climate agenda. Um, one of the other guys who I interviewed there when I interviewed the ringleaders of this event was Rabbi Yonatan Narel. Uh, he, he actually gave me a copy of his uh, new and improved Bible, um, it, it, he's got his uh, biblical commentary on there on uh, global warming and things. Um, and, and he very, he was very open. He says, we got to leverage faith communities to move the needle on climate act, uh, advocacy. Uh, he says that, um, religion and clergy need to be the delivery vehicle for climate action. Again, this was the, the head of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development that helped organize this. Uh, you also have the UN Faith for Earth Initiative. Uh, this is something that was rolled out a few years ago where the UN is bringing faith leaders together. Uh, their tagline is religion uniting for the planet, um, which is interesting. 
uh, and then there, uh, actually, I have the video of the executive director of this thing talking about it. He says 85% of the world's population believes in a faith or a religion. So the power of that is humongous. Uh, he says we can harness that in mobilizing faith leaders and faith followers in protecting the earth. Uh, he said that one of the main objectives of the Faith for Earth initiative is to strategically engage with faith-based organizations to mobilize faith leaders and the faith community in an effective partnership to collectively achieve the sustainable development goals and Agenda 2030. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Agenda 2030 has, has been referred to repeatedly by UN leaders as the master plan for humanity. Um, this was uh, signed and ratified in 2015. Uh, Barack Obama signed on for the United States. Every other national government signed on. Uh, Pope Francis was one of the big cheerleaders. Uh, and after it was approved, the Communist Party of China came out in all their propaganda organs, and they said that um, they actually played a crucial role in developing Agenda 2030. And so here you have the UN saying, we're going to bring faith leaders all together to bring everybody in line with this Agenda 2030. Uh, they actually released a book uh, two years ago. It's called Faith for Earth, A Call for Action. And they said that all the world's um, religions really agree with the UN environmental agenda. Uh, and so their goal, they said, is to empower, to encourage, to engage faith-based organizations at partners at all levels to achieve the sustainable development goals and Agenda 2030. Uh, and they, of course, have been very, very active on that. They have partnered with the World Council of Churches. They've partnered with the Muslim Council of Elders, the New York Board of Rabbis. Uh, they all signed the Climate Responsible Finance Agenda. Um, and actually, I've, I've run into a lot of these people over the years. So, you know, I know some of these people personally. Uh, I've, I've interviewed many of them and, you know, happy to share those resources. But um, they also have at the UN Environmental Program, which is kind of the UN Environmental Agency. Think of it like the UN's EPA. Uh, they created this UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Sustainable Development, where they're connecting uh, all these different arms of the UN with churches, with faith-based organizations, mosques, uh, synagogues, um, temples, things like that. Um, and they're very, very open about injecting what they call faith in the UN into these UN conferences. Now, of course, we as Christians don't have faith in the UN. We have faith in God and God only. Um, but um, they have a lot of like kind of spin-off organizations. They've, they've got one called the Elijah Board of World Religious Leaders that they say brings together some of the world's most prominent religious figures from Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, the pagan religions of India, uh, and of course, this group is actually funded by the UN itself, and in particular, UNESCO, the UN Educational Organization. Uh, other funders of this organization, which was involved in the Ten Commandments, uh, the new Ten Commandments, by the way, uh, the Carnegie Fund, uh, the Fetzer Institute, which was founded by a disciple of Alice Bailey, the, uh, the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, the Bronfen family. Um, and so they... Uh, they they have kind of put all this out there. Now, uh, the religious events that took place at the COP27 were organized by uh, a UN-backed organization called Religions for Peace. Uh, they've been doing this for a very long time. Um, their new leader is actually, before becoming the leader of this Religions for Peace, uh, she was actually working for the UN Population Fund, which has determined that there are too many people on this planet, but the UN will save us from that. And so their primary mission is actually to reduce the population of people on the planet. And uh, the leader of this thing, she said at the COP27, uh, she said, the question is not whether religion should be engaged. The question is how. Uh, we've got two important things to keep in mind here. This meeting is important. The uh, other 40 faith-based meetings at this COP27 are important. But what's even more important is how can these religious actors come together and do effective programs and initiatives? Again, this is a lady who's previous job was reducing the number of people on the planet. Um, they brought a lot of prominent people together for this thing. And uh, the new ethics and morality that we mentioned in that report, um, I believe this is what they're now in the process of unveiling. Uh, they, they believe that the old ethics and morality that God revealed to mankind through the Ten Commandments, through Moses, um, is not just obsolete, it is actually contributing to this alleged climate emergency. And so we need a new system, uh, new moral codes. Um, and so that's what they're working on. Now, um, Peter Drucker, a uh, very influential, uh, his kind of co cover story was management guru. Um, he came up with this idea that what you really needed to bring about huge transformations in the world was what he described as a three-legged stool. Uh, you needed the first leg of the stool, which would be governments, right? Uh, and that's where the UN comes in. The UN brings together all of the national governments in the world under one umbrella. The next leg of the stool, he said, would be the business sector, the private sector, companies, right? Industries. 
Uh, and so bringing together the industries of the world is Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. Uh, of course, the World Economic Forum brings together the Fortune 1000, the CEOs of all the world's biggest companies uh, in unison with the UN. In fact, they actually signed a strategic partnership with the UN in 2019 to bring businesses on board with the UN Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, again, that they called the Master Plan for Humanity. Now, the third stool that Peter Drucker talked about was the religions of the world. Uh, so the first stool, or the first leg was the public sector, the governments. Second leg was the private sector. The third leg was the social sector, which he said was primarily religious institutions and non-governmental organizations. Uh, and so Pope Francis was one of the early advocates of Agenda 2030, but now all of the major religions in the world, with the exception, I would argue, of the true church of Jesus Christ, have joined on board with this. Now, that organization, Religions for Peace, that I told you about, they actually came together uh, shortly before COVID. They met in Germany at their 10th World Assembly, and they created what they call an alliance of virtue. They claim to represent 7 billion people on this planet, which is what, seven out of eight people living on this planet are represented by the religious leaders who came together for this meeting. It was funded again by the UN, the US State Department, George Soros, uh, the Rockefellers, and they had over 1,000 religious leaders who came together at this World Assembly. They created this alliance of virtue, as I said, and they agreed to unite together and focus on what they say are the virtues shared widely across religious traditions and other virtue heritages. Uh, they also signed a final declaration, and I'm going to quote from it here. They all agreed to, and I'm quoting, urge their religious communities to invest their resources in alignment with achieving the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they went on to say in this same declaration, we commit to human development as set forth in the Sustainable Development Goals, and they added that they will advocate for government policies that bring uh, everybody into line with this UN vision. So, um, what you have here is uh, an effort to bring all of the religions of the world together on board with this, what I view as a completely diabolical UN agenda to bring the world under control. Now, this is not a new agenda. Uh, over 20 years ago, my colleague, uh, William Jasper, who was going to these UN meetings for the New American Magazine before I was, uh, for the same reason, to gather information, um, he was at a meeting over 20 years ago uh, where they met. And um, Mikhail Gorbachev, the uh, dictator of the Soviet Union at the time, uh, actually publicly declared, and I'm quoting here from him, my hope is that this charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments, a sermon on the mount that provides a guide for human behavior toward the environment in the next century and beyond. That was more than 20 years ago, talking about the UN Earth Charter. Um, I, I could probably pull up a picture for you guys in a moment, but they actually carried it in in like a fake Ark of the Covenant, right? Um, treating it like with all, all this reverence. Um, now, one of the key players in all of this UN uh, religious agenda is Alice Bailey. I mentioned her earlier. She was the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company. Um, the World Core Curriculum, which the UN says should be taught in every school on the planet, is actually based, according to the guy who wrote it, Assistant Secretary General Robert Mueller, on the teachings of Alice Bailey. Uh, and of course, Alice Bailey didn't act alone. Uh, she was channeling these uh, spiritual entities that she called Ascended Masters. Uh, the, the most prominent of these was called Javal Kul. And uh, these demons were giving her uh, secret information about the coming new age, about the coming one world government system, about how the uh, UN was going to lead this, about how the different religions of the world would all unite. Uh, and she talked about the, the main heresy that has to be dealt with is this heresy of separateness. Uh, and by heresy of separateness, she's really talking about the Christian doctrine that we are to be separate, that we are to be holy, that we are to be in the world, but not of the world, right? Um, that's what she's talking about. And without using the specific terms, when you read between the lines, what she's talking about here is ultimately a genocide of massive proportions. Uh, a lot of these people think they're doing the right thing. They believe, um, and I, I can't put this in any plainer terms, they believe that Christians are holding back this evolution of mankind, that if they could just get Christians out of the way, true Bible-believing Christians, not fake Christians who are participating in this, uh, then humanity would evolve, we would get this new collective consciousness, uh, the world would become really a paradise on earth, uh, and they're getting a lot of this, uh, and, and again, they're very open about this, they don't hide it, you won't read it on the front page of your newspaper, but if you go to their websites, if you read their speeches, if you read their books, they're very open about the fact that they are communicating with spiritual entities. Of course, the Bible tells us these are not ascended masters, these are not ancestor spirits, uh, these are demonic entities that are deceiving these people. These people have been deceived by by what the Bible describes as the God of this world. Um, 
So uh, that is essentially what we're dealing with, folks. And I'd, I'd like to just close with a few scriptures. I know we've only got a few minutes left here, but uh, I would like to close with a few um, scriptures. And so let me pull up uh, another PowerPoint presentation here. Um, here, I'm just going to go ahead and, and share my screen right here. So. Uh, we'll share a screen one. That sounds good. All right. Uh, so, uh, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 4, uh, we read that the God of this world, and it's referring to Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Uh, that is what we're dealing with here, folks. We are dealing with satanic deception. Uh, these are people who have been blinded. They have been deceived by Satan. Now, we don't want to misunderstand the scripture, right? This doesn't mean Satan's God, Satan's a God, Satan's a legitimate counterpart to God. Of course, we as Christians know that Satan is a created being, uh, that God has him completely under his control and authority and dominion. Uh, in fact, if you go read the book of Job, um, he needs to ask God for permission for everything, right? You want to do this to Job? Well, he goes and asks God for permission to do that. So Satan is not this kind of like autonomous being that could just kind of resist God at will. Uh, you know, God is sovereign uh, and God is allowing Satan to do these things for the time being. Uh, actually, in 1 John chapter 5, we read that we know that we are from God, but the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Right? So when you see all of these religions and governments and businesses coming together, uh, recognize that the Bible describes clearly what's happening here. The whole world right now is in the power of the evil one. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon. If you go to uh, Psalm 2, this was true even in the days of King David. The kings of the earth, it says, take their stand. The rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one, right? Thousands of years ago, the kings of the world, the most powerful people on the planet, were conspiring against God and his anointed one. Um, and you can imagine God was probably just terrified of these um, little kings conspiring against him. I right? know, right? If you go to verse four, you read that the one enthroned in heaven laughs. God ridicules these people. Um, and so, you know, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, the, the good news is that... Um, you know, these people are wrong. They are deceived. The bad news is it's easy for us to judge these people because, um, you know, they're so they're so wrong. They're so clearly involved in evil. But uh, we were in the same boat as them, right? We were on that same highway to not climate hell, but actual hell as all of these other people who are deceived, who are serving Satan. Uh, but thankfully, Jesus Christ came and he died uh, to, to pay the penalty for our sin, right? We've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. The penalty for that is, of course, death, uh, eternal death, uh, hell. Uh, but God sent his only son to die for our sins. And so we praise him for that. As we read in Romans chapter 10, verse nine, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, now, we don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices, right? The apostle Paul says we are not uh, ignorant of his devices. Uh, we should not be scared of these people or their agenda. We should resist the devil and he will flee from us, is what we read in James chapter four, verse seven. Uh, you know, me as, as a journalist, I feel beyond blessed to be able to uh, reprove and expose this evil all day, every day. Uh, and I can tell you, going to these things, you feel the evil in these conferences. You feel the demonic influences that are here. It, it, it is palatable. You feel it. I mean, it's like a physical feeling that you feel when you go into these places. And it's gotten progressively worse as the years have gone along. These things used to be kind of fun. Uh, they are just pure darkness today when I go to them. Um, and it, it's it's almost uh, frightening. You know, if I if I didn't know that God had not sent us a spirit of fear, I might even succumb to the fear. But um you know, we are, to, we are to have no fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness. We are to reprove them. We are to expose them. Uh, so I feel beyond blessed that I get to do that all day, every day. Uh, we know that God expects us to hate evil, uh, not to hate the sinners, but to hate evil. Um, and, uh, you know, we know we, also that we are in a spiritual battle. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, we know how are we how we are to combat that. We take up the uh, shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked or the evil one, some translations say, and we take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, right? We know that the planet is not doomed from climate change, right? We know exactly what's going to happen to this planet. Uh, it is going to be destroyed. It is going to be burned up, but it's not going to be because you drive an SUV. Uh, it's not going to be because of the gas you exhale, the gas of life. Um, you know, Jesus gave us our example of how we are to respond to these satanic lies, right? When Satan tempted Christ and said, hey, just bow down and, you know, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world, right? And notice Jesus didn't say, hey, those aren't your kingdoms, right? Who do you think you are? Uh, he actually said, um, get the hand Satan for what? It is written, right? So even Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our King, the Creator, used the scriptures 
when dealing with Satan. So it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And that is how we should respond, right? What do the scriptures say? It doesn't matter what your pseudoscience says. It doesn't matter, um, you know, what uh, Antonio Guterres or Joe Biden or all the uh, fake scientists in the world say, um, you know, we need to turn to the scriptures as our guide for all of this. Um, you know, I, I, I guess uh, we're pretty much out of time, so we can kind of leave it at that. Uh, I know we have some time for questions. I can get into much more depth on any of these issues if you guys want, you know, whether you're interested in the science of climate change, whether you're interested in what happens at these events, whether you're interested in the policies that came out, um, you know, wh whatever it is that you want to learn more about, I am very happy to discuss, but uh, we'll just leave it there for now. And uh, thank you guys so much for, for listening. I'm sorry my PowerPoint presentation wasn't totally done, but I hope this has been informational for you. And hey, Terry. Hi. Yeah, that was, it was definitely very informational and um, no worries about your PowerPoint. I think that, that you covered a lot of stuff. And so um, it was, it was definitely interesting. What are a couple of the policies? Like you said, you said um, we could talk a, a little bit more about a couple of different things and policies was one of them. What are a couple of like, maybe the, the most key policies that could affect us realistically that could like really change the way that we would live from day to day. So um, the policies that are coming through under the guise of climate actually touch every area of our lives, uh, from, from our food systems, from our agriculture systems, from our private property rights to the cost of living. Uh, everything is going to be transformed. But every year when they do these things, they come up with an international agreement. And uh, in this international agreement, the one they signed in Egypt, uh, they, they made really some major progress as far as they're concerned. Uh, one of the things that they got approved for the first time ever was this admission of guilt from uh, the U.S. government for John Kerry was purporting to represent us there. Uh, although Joe, Joe Biden was there, he left after a few days, uh, and John Kerry kind of handled the negotiations. Uh, so they got them to admit in a signed policy document, an international agreement, that the United States and the American people are responsible for the climate crisis as a result of our CO2 emissions and that we need to pay reparations for that. Now, they didn't get a fixed number on the reparations yet, but they got an admission of guilt from our supposed leaders. Um, they promised to redistribute trillions of dollars. Uh, they promised to restructure the entire global economy under the guise of saving us from CO2. Um, the, the numbers that they do put into this uh, are literally in the trillions, right? They talk about they need four to eight trillion dollars to restructure the global economy. Uh, they're talking about trillions of dollars worth of reparations payments to, to governments in third world countries for the alleged uh, climate crimes that we Americans have committed by, uh, say, having power plants, by driving cars, things like this, by uh, basically inventing the modern world, Um there's a lot in there about uh, you know the, the need to deal with population. And this has been something that's been very clear at all these UN conferences. And it's very much a part of the Biden administration's policies. Uh, actually, Obama's science czar, John Holdren, um, he's been on this bandwagon from the start. He wrote a book in 1973 called Human Ecology. That was back when he was still sounding the alarm about man-made global cooling, uh, where he called for de-developing the United States. Um, he called in another book called Eco Science, published in 1980, uh, 1977, for um, putting sterilizing agents in the water supply to make sure Americans couldn't have children without government permission. Uh, he called for using forced abortions to, um, to stop uh, procreation among Americans to deal with the population crisis that he said was contributing to the global cooling crisis, now you know, been transformed to the global warming crisis. Um, so under the guise of climate change, uh, you know, the simplest way to understand is they intend to make energy more and more and more expensive until they finally succeed in bankrupting our country. And it's interesting, I, I was in Paris when they came up with the UN Paris Agreement, which at this point is kind of the governing document over all this. And uh, while the US government, Barack Obama in particular, offered to cut US CO2 emissions by about one third over the coming 10 years, the communist Chinese government promised they were gonna continue increasing their CO2 emissions um, until at least 2030 and probably after that. Uh, they are building coal-fired power plants right now faster than we can count them. They are powering the factories that build these dumb windmills and solar panels that we're paying for with our tax money through subsidies. Uh, they're powering them with coal-fired power plants. Uh, and what's so interesting is that if you actually believe the hypothesis that CO2 is causing climate change, that CO2 is bad for the planet, the worst thing in the world that you could possibly do is shut down production in the United States or in Europe or in Canada or in Japan and ship that production over to China. Because every unit of production that comes out of China is massively more CO2 intensive than that same unit of production in America. 
Uh, we use much cleaner uh, power than the Chinese do. Uh, and yet at these conferences, and they've continued to do this, they're celebrating that the Chinese are continuing to increase their CO2 emissions while ours fall off a cliff, while we uh, basically commit national economic suicide. Uh, and so really, without even understanding any of the science, you can tell right there that the people at the top of this pyramid do not themselves believe that CO2 is some sort of toxic pollution that's going to kill the planet. Uh, John Kerry would probably stop flying around in his private jet if he truly believed that. Uh, he would probably get rid of some of his many mansions around the country, each one of which has a bigger carbon footprint than probably all of our families on this call combined. Uh, I mean, Al Gore has got a carbon footprint bigger than you know a small African country. Uh, and so... Uh, those are some of the policies that are coming out. Uh, basically, the goal is to deindustrialize the Western world, deindustrialize the United States, cause electricity rates to skyrocket and take what little wealth remains to us after they bankrupt the middle class and then redistribute that through the United Nations to the uh, kleptocratic regimes that rule over most of the third world. I mean, really, couldn't they even conduct their conference on Zoom if they cared that much? They absolutely could. The, the, the carbon footprint of these things is so massive. They used to try to calculate, not the UN, but uh, outside observers used to try to calculate it. Um, it, it. This happens every time, right? Every time I land at one of the airports to go to these climate conferences, there are private jets lined up as far as the eye can see because you've got all these celebrities, all these dignitaries, they're showing up on private jets, they're taking gas guzzling limousines, bulletproof, bombproof from the airport over to the summit, they're feasting on caviar and steak tartare, and um, you know they're bringing their whole staffs and all their security. Uh, but absolutely, if they truly believe that CO2 is so dangerous, um, you'd think they'd probably want to do something like this on Zoom, rather than uh, putting huge amounts, many, many tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and, and so let, a little bit off topic, but something that you're also, um, you know, pretty informed on. There was some recent news about the digital currency change changes that are coming, um, going to a cashless society. Can you give us a little update on what the status of that is and how close in the immediate future it's going to really impact us? Yeah, and, and this is actually all ultimately part of the same agenda. Right? We're, we're, we're talking about uh, really the same effort to build a totalitarian one world system. Climate change is part of the pretext. Uh, CBDCs will be a big part of it if they get their way. Um, so they're making very rapid progress on this. Uh, some countries have already unveiled their CBDCs. In fact, one of our neighbors, uh, the Bahamas, has already unveiled what they call the sand dollar. It's a central bank digital currency for the Bahamas. Nigeria has already rolled one out. Um, and all this is being coordinated at the international level by something called the Bank for International Settlements. Um, so the Biden administration has been working on this for some time. In 2022, in March, Biden signed an executive order uh, uh, saying that his administration places the highest urgency on the development and deployment of a U.S. central bank digital currency. Uh, and actually, I have a video uh, handy. I, maybe I can show it real quick of um, the general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, which is coordinating the, globally the policy towards central bank digital currencies. Uh, and I'll let him explain the significance of this uh, central bank digital currency, because we're being told that it's kind of just like cash, right? It's it's not really that big of a difference from cash. Well, when they're talking and they think nobody's listening, um, they're actually much more open about what's truly going on with these CBDCs. And so I'll let this individual uh, explain the significance here. Um, let's see. Here he is. For our analysis on CBDC, in particular for the use of general, to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash. Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also, we will have the technology to enforce that. Those, are, those two issues are extremely important, and that makes a huge difference with respect to what, to what cash is. Uh, 
So they will have absolute control, he says, over central bank digital currencies. Uh, and the ultimate objective is actually uh, what Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, describes as a fusion of our biological and our digital identities. And so once they move to a digital currency, they can force you to use a smartphone. And then after that, they can force you to put it on your microchip, which they're already starting to market people. But here's Klaus Schwab kind of giving you the end game of where all this digital uh, stuff is going to end up. It's at the end what, what the fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities. Yeah, so um, so the, it's coming. Uh, I suspect that we'll probably see the introduction of a U.S. central bank digital currency uh, potentially as soon as this summer. Um, I don't think they'll abolish cash right away. They need some time to work out the kinks in the system. Uh, but I suspect it'll inter it'll be introduced kind of running in parallel with the uh, cash U.S. dollar. And over time, they'll work on demonizing cash. They'll say it's only for terrorists and criminals and tax cheats and drug dealers. Um, and then uh, little by little, they'll try to make it so everybody has to have only CBDCs. Uh, and they may use a big crisis to bring that in. So I, I think we can expect that within the next few years, certainly. I mean, and it's not even like they're trying to hide it. I mean, they're completely admitting what they're doing. So, yep. so many people, like a lot of people are not aware of this, but there are a lot of people who are. And I, I've read some stories about, I mean, Christians tend to be more aware of what's going on like this because they're reading the end of the book also, right? And so they're seeing how things are falling into place, not falling apart, but falling into place. So I've also taken notice that even non-Christians are realizing, are starting to wake up and realize, like, are there any big movements that you're aware of to counter this kind of thing? Um, you know, there are, uh, there's, there's a growing amount of opposition when it comes to CBDCs, for example, I have been talking with uh, state legislators across the country for several weeks now, uh, here in my state of Florida, um, our governor has proposed and our legislature has introduced a, band, a bill to actually ban CBDCs. Uh, it's a very good bill. I'm, I'm very strongly supportive. In fact, I'm urging uh, representatives in many other states to pursue similar policies. Uh, and I've already got some commitments from uh, representatives in multiple Republican states to introduce bills like that. Uh, you know, one state might not be able to do it on its own, but 20 Republican states coming together and saying we're not going to participate in a central bank digital currency would really throw a monkey wrench into the plans. Um, actually, uh, the governor of South Dakota, Christy Nome, recently vetoed. Um, so one of the ways that they're bringing this in at, at the state level, they're trying to get states to pass these um, changes to the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, the Uniform Commercial Code, kind of every, all, all 50 states have kind of passed some version of the UCC to try to facilitate commerce between the different states. You know, so every state still retains its sovereignty, its autonomy, but they all pass pretty similar laws so that we can you know, be able to do business across state lines without a lot of trouble. Well, the uh, Uniform Law Commission, which is not technically a government agency, but the state governments send representatives there, uh, they're urging states now to pass these changes to uh, the UCC that would redefine money, that would add to the definition of money, that it can also be a unit of account uh, established through uh, an intergovernmental agreement between governments. So we're talking about international CBDCs here. Now, thankfully, the governor of South Dakota, the legislature passed this, and I can't imagine why they did that. Uh, the governor thankfully vetoed it and put out a brilliant statement saying, look, there's a lot of reasons I'm not going to sign this. This is dangerous. But, um, you know, most importantly, this is opening the door to a, a central bank digital currency. This is opening the door to federal abuses. They haven't even announced what it's going to look like. We should not be, uh, you know, passing this yet. Um, and so a lot of other legislators across the country were inspired by that. Uh, another thing that's happening in parallel with that is you've got a lot of states uh, passing laws. Actually, Arkansas just passed this week. I covered it on my website, libertysentinel.org, uh, just passed a bill to make gold and silver legal tender. Um, and, and this is something that I've been very passionate about for, for over a decade. You know, gold and silver, that's God's money, right? This uh, unjust system of weights and measures masquerading as a monetary system is really, uh, in my opinion, a criminal operation. Um, and so it's very good that the states are, are taking these steps to do it. Um, I also believe, you know, if our country's, if you think of it like the Titanic, it's getting ready to go down. Um, you know, we want at the state level to have states building lifeboats as quickly as possible, preferably before the process, the, the crisis is in progress. Um, and so the more states, I think there's eight or nine states now that have passed these laws, uh, that will give citizens an option 
to conduct commerce in something other than U.S. dollars if the currency collapses, if they get, all get sucked out of the system, um, if, uh, you know, wh whatever happens, the individuals and businesses in these states will be able to continue to do business because of these sensible laws that are being put in place. Uh, so that's kind of a snapshot of what's happening. On the climate front, a lot of opposition as well. Um, actually, there's a, a major push right now by the UN to, uh, to usurp all these new um, powers to deal with international emergencies. Um, I just broke a, a big article about that in the Epic Times uh, last week. And as part of that, I reached out to some key people in Congress, uh, including uh, Congressman uh, Mike McCall, who's the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and uh, he sent me a, a great statement. I quoted it. He said, you know, I'm very concerned about this, that Biden's going to use this to uh, impose his climate agenda on us. And so, you know, the, the House Republicans could stop all of this right now if they wanted to. All they've got to do is defund it. Um, the federal government cannot spend any money unless the House appropriates it. And so with Republicans in control of the House, all they have to say is, no, Joe Biden, you're not getting any money for climate stuff. You're not getting any money for the UN. You're not getting any money for shutting down power plants or for, you know, forcing car makers to uh, get rid of engines or, you know, whatever it is that they're working on. So at the congressional level, and I've talked to several members of Congress who say we're going to try to defund some of this stuff come September when the budget bills start coming up. Uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, and at the state level, again, uh, a lot of action at the state level. We saw very clearly during um, COVID, uh, a number of states resisting, especially my state here in Florida. Um, and, and I was uh, very pleased with what our, our governor did during that time. And uh, we do have a lot of efforts. Uh, Oklahoma is helping to lead the way and Texas helping to lead the way against these climate shenanigans saying, you know, we're not going to let you shut down our power plants. We're not going to let you uh, shut down our power grid. So there's a lot that state and local governments can do to resist uh, the CBDCs, the climate madness. It's not even about climate um, and all of these dangerous things coming down from the UN and the federal government. Uh, um, I also like if we think about with the climate change and the different regulations, the things that could go wrong. I mean, it's kind of obvious to some people, but to the point that how can they be putting so much in this? Like, so California, I mean, we're a group that's based in California and, and there, you know, the governor there is just, you know, so far. And so, um, all of the regulations I was just reading about in, in my own town that they, they're building the first solar powered community where all of the homes will be electric only and all solar that they're actually gonna be connected to so that they have this reserve power that will be shared and, and it's kind of this test. So just all of the things that could go wrong and the regulations of, of vehicles being electric electric, but then also California's electric grid fails so much. So what other things can you see as, as potential hazards that we're going to be facing? Yeah, you, you gave some really good examples there. Uh, and I, I think what happened in Texas, um, I, was it last year, maybe a year before last, where numerous, I think dozens of people froze to death when the power grid failed. Uh, that was a direct result of these green energy schemes, these silly windmills that they brought online. Um, and, and the reality is these communities that say, we're going to be a solar powered community. Uh, it's really a bunch of baloney. Uh, there's no such thing. Uh, you can't have a, a windmill powered community. Uh, all of these things actually require either massive amounts of battery storage, which is so environmentally devastating, so uneconomical. Uh, you might as well take a huge boatload of money and set it on fire uh, before doing something so dumb. Um, but the reality is all, all of these grids that are adding solar powers and windmills and stuff, uh, they all have to be backed up by coal-fired power plants or traditional power plants, natural gas or, or nuclear or whatever it is. Uh, and they have to be running. You can't just like, oh, there's no wind today. We better turn on the power plant. It takes time to crank them up. So uh, really what you're doing is you're destroying the environment. You're sending money over to the chai -coms. But really what we're talking about here is the collapse of our energy infrastructure. Um, and as Obama said in that clip that I showed, when, when he talks about making the price of electricity skyrocket was the term he used, uh, we need to understand that there are major economic repercussions for that, right? Um, there are people who are just barely eking out a living. There are people who having to pay skyrocketing power bill means they're not going to be able to feed their kids. They're not going to be able to pay for their medicine. They're not going to be able to put fuel in their car to get to work. There are billions of people on this planet who are on the edge of not just 
poverty, but catastrophic and potentially deadly poverty. Uh, so when we look at these policies, um, you know, one of the great climate scientists, uh, John Christie at the University of Alabama, used to be senior climate scientist at NASA, uh, he started calling these people global warming Nazis because uh, what they're talking about here is sacrificing millions of innocent people to these crazy climate goals. So um, when Obama talks about skyrocketing energy prices, we need to understand what the full repercussions of that are. When our energy prices skyrocket and communist Chinese energy prices stay flat and stay low because they're building coal-fired power plants and sensible uh, solutions, what happens is our factories leave. And when our factories leave, our jobs leave. And without jobs and factories, we can't do anything. We can't feed ourselves. We can't pay the taxes that we need to pay now to dig ourselves out of this 30 whatever trillion dollars in debt that we find ourselves in. We can't pay into Social Security to take care of the elderly who now have been convinced that they need to depend on the government to be able to survive in their retirement. Um, the knock-on effects of this are absolutely catastrophic. And so I think it, at, at a bare minimum, we can con expect a continued decline in the standard of living. Um, and at the more extreme end, we can expect a catastrophic failure of the grid, which has, of course, deadly implications for everyone. Well, Alex, the good news is California has a way to fix that. They've just come out with a new tiered system for charging electric for electric bills. I don't know if you saw that. Story. I did Bob, see that Bob energy communism. That. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, I have a joke about California, and I, you guys probably won't think it's funny. But uh, what's the joke? Or what's the difference between uh, uh, the Titanic and California? Oh no! <laughs> well, the Titanic had the lights on as it was sinking into the sea. Yeah, you know, California, not so much. Uh, but I mean, really, you, you guys have a, a government that said you can't drive a electric or a normal cars after what was it, twenty thirty or twenty thirty five? And then just a few few days later, your governor is saying, "By the way, please don't charge your electric cars because uh, the power grid can't handle it." I mean, what kind of craziness is this? Well, they want to keep us in one place, right? Yep, exactly. 15-minute cities coming yep. soon to a city near you. Actually, they're coming here to Florida, believe it or not. So, yeah. Okay, so Bill here in our group, he's asking, how will a cashless society affect drug cartels? I suspect that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the move to legalize drugs. Um, I suspect drugs will be legal by the time we move to a fully cashless society. Um you know, that, that it's already functionally happened in a lot of like, California being one of them, you know, uh, Colorado just legalized shrooms and or Oregon just legalized, decriminalized basically all drugs, heroin, crack, uh, whatever. Um, and you, you know what, I, I, I'm not necessarily like a drug war kind of guy. Um, but I, I think there is a, a deliberate agenda behind this promoting of drugs and uh, trying to get kids, you know, hooked on hallucinogens and cracked out of their mind and addicted to drugs. I think there's something really demonic about this. Um, and, and I think they're trying to legalize drugs, partly so they can facilitate the cashless society, but also partly because they want our young people zonked out of their minds and, and high instead of paying attention to these things or pursuing truth. So. OK, so so all of those questions, let's have the last one be give us some words of encouragement. What are some things that we can do and what are some things, some ways that we can prepare and to be optimistic? Yeah, well, I mean, as Christians, we must be optimistic, right? We we know how this ends. We know our Lord, our Savior, our King is coming back. Uh, we know that this evil only has a short time left. Um, and, and we know that the gospel is going to continue to advance. We know that the, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, it's hard to get more optimistic than that. Um, we know the outcome of this, right? Uh, the people who should be scared, the people who should be absolutely terrified are the people on the other side. Uh, and, and I think a lot of them are too blinded to realize it, but their reign of terror is coming to an end. You can take that to the bank, not uh, Silicon Valley Bank, but uh, you know the divine bank uh, you know, where we store our true treasure in heaven, uh, not here on earth. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I expect things are going to get more crazy uh, in the years ahead. And, and I don't want to give people a false sense of hope that you know, I'm not a prosperity preacher. If you just send me tithe money, you're going to be healthy and wealthy and everything's going to go great for you. It's not right. Uh, Jesus Christ told us that all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. We should expect persecution. Uh, if they're not saying mean things about you, if they're not coming after you, you're probably not doing it right. Right. Uh, Jesus said, hey, they hated me first. They're going to hate you, too. 
Uh, and so we should expect those things, but we should also uh, just have absolute confidence and absolute joy knowing that none of this is outside of God's control. None of this is a surprise to God. The evil is going to come to an end. God is going to turn his enemies into the footstool of Christ. Uh, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Um, and we're going to see it. So, um, you know, I, I'm excited. And, you know, I, my message for these weirdos and globalists and, and climate nuts that want to, you know, shut down our society and kill kids, um, you know, you need to repent, okay? Because um, you have a very limited amount of time here, uh, and you could be headed off into eternity in the next 10 seconds. You are not guaranteed another breath. You are not guaranteed another single beat of your heart. You would be very wise to repent right now to put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ uh, and stop doing this evil. Come over to the winning team. Uh, the, the end is already written. There's nothing that you and your buddies and your fake media and your trillions of dollars that you stole from us are going to be able to do to stop it. It's all coming to an end. And uh, you know what? I, I could not be more excited. I could not be more encouraged. It's not to downplay the seriousness of the things that we're facing. Uh, I mean, you know, Satan's running around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? Um, that, you know, that, that's concerning. But uh, oh, in, in the end, we know that um, this is all going to work real well. And, and even here in the physical, you know, I, I, I sometimes tell people we are in a spiritual war and we need to take that really seriously. Um, the Bible is just filled with wonderful words of encouragement. Um, one, one of the books that I go to, Judges, um, in, in Judges chapter seven, you read the story of Gideon. Right. Uh, and, and God chooses this insignificant nobody to, to build up the army and, and ultimately to crush uh, the enemies of God's people. And it's amazing because he's got this army of like 30 something thousand people. God's like, that's way too big. You know, send, send the cowards home. And oh, your army's still too big. Send them down to drink and sends almost everybody home. They're down at 300 guys and, and, and Gideon's like, OK, God, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have some kind of plan. You know, that's kind of like us right now. We look like we're surrounded um, or, you know, go to Second Kings. You read the story of Elisha. Uh, not Elijah. This was uh, Elisha, uh, Elijah's follower, Elisha. And uh, he had been helping the king of Israel to avoid the king of Syria. And, you know, the king of Syria is all mad because uh, this guy, Elisha, has been helping the king of Israel know like where the attack was going to come from. So the king of Syria determines he's going to go find Elisha. They get this big war party together. They go after him uh, and they find him. And uh, Elisha's servant wakes him up. He's like, oh, man, we're surrounded. You know, we're in so much trouble. What are we going to do? Uh, and Elisha is like, you know, calm down. And he prays. And you got to open this guy's eyes. And so God opens the servant's eyes and they look out the window. Turns out it's not Elisha and his servant who are surrounded. It's the enemies who are surrounded, right? They look out on the hills and there's all these chariots of fire, right? These angelic beings that God has dispatched to, to protect them. Um, uh, another story out of uh, Second Kings, you've got uh, the uh, Assyrians have come against the people of God and they're you know surrounding uh, uh, Jerusalem. And God dispatches one angel, like literally one angel. Um, and this one angel slaughters 185,000 enemy soldiers, and it just leaves them all dead. Uh, and so if God can send one angel to slaughter 185,000 enemy troops that have come against God's people, uh, we can be sure that he's got more than one angel, and we can be sure that those angels can handle people like, um, you know, these evildoers that are pursuing this climate stuff. So we really should be encouraged. Um, you know, nothing's going to happen to you that uh, is outside of what God allows. And uh, we just need to have absolute trust and confidence in his sovereignty. He is in charge. He's got it all under control. The outcome of this battle doesn't depend on us, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, and so praise the Lord. Just, you know, uh, worship God knowing all of that. Yeah, that's a great word of encouragement. So, Alex, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to have you. And and it's so informative. But then also, it's it's good to hear your encouragement. So um, just before we sign off on the on the live stream and recording, if you could tell everybody one more time some ways that they can find you and and support you, follow you. Uh, sure. Well, thank you so much, Terry. Uh, my personal website is libertysentinel.org. You can see it behind me. Um, and I didn't realize when I chose the name Sentinel that Americans didn't know how to spell Sentinel. It's S-E-N-T-I-N-E-L. Uh, and then it's .org, uh, not .com. Um, my, uh, one of our ministries is a public school exit. We're working to get kids out of the public schools so that they can spell words like Sentinel in the future. And more importantly, so that they can uh, you know, know more about God, they can know truth and uh, et cetera. Um, I'm on the most of the social media companies. Um, I'm senior editor at the New American Magazine. That's where you'll find a lot of my climate articles. They're the ones who send me around the world to these UN conferences. Um, and, and that's good enough. Uh, thank you again, Terry, for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks to uh, everybody who came out. God bless you all. Really appreciate it.
Yeah. And uh, once again, we're Creation Fellowship CNT, and you can find links to most of our past presentations, including tonight's, will be found there as well um, by going to tinyurl.com forward slash CF Santee. That's C like creation, F like fellowship, and Santee is spelled S A N. T E E. And you can also email us at creationfellowshipsantee at gmail.com so that you get on our up on our um, list and you won't miss any of our upcoming speakers. And um, I would love to tell you who next week's speaker is, but at the moment I'm at a loss. So just visit our, our page and you'll see the list of speakers there. So um, we have some really good ones coming up. So with that, we're going to go ahead and sign off.